Hello everyone. Um, today we are going to continue from where we left off in the last class, um, where we were looking at backscattered electrons and how they can be detected using the solid state detector, right? So a quick recap. Um, if you look at the energy spectrum of the number of electrons that are coming out of the sample, then you have the secondary electrons, which are typically electrons with energy less than 50 electron volts. And then you have a wide range of backscattered electrons, which are generated from elastic scattering. And they will have energies all the way up to E0, which is the energy of the incoming electron beam onto the specimen. Okay, so the whole um, um, idea of the, of, the, of the talk today in, in my lecture is to figure out how we can detect these extremely low energy secondary electrons. Okay, so one of the most popular detectors is the Everhard Thornley detector that was generated uh, back in the day. Um, and this is capable of detecting both secondary and backscattered electrons. Um, and let's take a look at where it is positioned inside the electron chamber. So you have your, your lens here and the incoming electron. This is your, uh, the area where you would place a, the specimen. Um, and this right here, in marked by the yellow box, is the um, Everhard Thornley detector. And I want you to take note of the metallic cage-like feature on the tip of the of the detector. And then that it's very important how that is that enables the collection of the low energy secondary electrons. Okay, so. Um, uh, I'm going to just refer to this as the ET detector. Um, so the ET detector is basically a scintillator photomultiplier type of detector. Um, a scintillator is something with, that generates photons when electrons are incident on it. Um, that's what a scintillating material is. And a photomultiplier is something that multiplies the, uh, the number of photons um, and, and and we'll talk about that in, in the next few slides. Okay. Typically, the uh, ET detector is mounted at about 30 degrees, right? So that immediately tells you that there's going to be an angular dependence on the way the image is formed. Unlike the solid state detector, which is placed right where the electron beam is, it is placed concentric to the optic axis. This is at a angle and in one direction. So we'll see how that impacts the quality of the image. Right, and as I said, it has a metallic mesh on the on the tip, which is also called a Faraday cage. Uh, typically, that Faraday cage is maintained at a positive bias of about 200 to 300 volts, and what it basically does is it creates an attractive force for the extremely low energy secondary electrons. So the electrons from the specimen just keep drifting towards the positive bias until they enter the detector. Right, that's the entire principle of why this electron, why this metallic mesh is around the tip of the detector, okay? So this is a schematic of the uh, detector itself. Um, the region which is in the blue box is inside the chamber and the region which is in the green box is outside the chamber, okay? So you have the incoming electrons they fall on your sample and then you have either backscattered electrons or secondary electrons that are generated they keep going in their respective directions and the positive bias which is on the faraday cage that is what attracts the low energy electrons towards the detector okay the, the low energy um, uh, electrons the secondary electrons are negatively charged and the det detector is positive which is why the attractive forces uh, work on them, right? So now, once the electron enter the Faraday cage, they hit the scintillator. But in order for the electrons to be attracted all the way to the scintillator, you need to apply a positive, uh, a relatively high uh, positive voltage, typically between 10 to 12 kilovolts. And, and there are two things that the Faraday cage is doing here. It is screening the positive voltage on the scintillator so that the incoming beam does not see that positive voltage at all, right? So the Faraday cage 
screening this positive voltage from the incoming beam or the backscattered electrons. Only the electrons that are moving away from the sample or generated from the sample, the secondary electrons, those that are attracted by the positive charge of the Faraday cage, once they enter the Faraday cage, that is only when they experience the positive 12 kilovolts on the scintillator and then they are quickly accelerated towards it with their 12 kilo electron volt energy, right? Plus or minus whatever the incident energy of the secondary electron was, right? So the scintillator is basically a phosphorescent material, right? And as soon as the electron falls on it, it converts that electron, the energy from the electron into photons. So now you have light, you have visible light. So now the photons are guided through the light guide onto the photocathode. Okay. Scintillator material typically could be calcium fluoride, it could be a garnet crystal, it could be lithium activated glass, uh, anything that, that lights up as soon as electrons fall on top of it. Okay. So now for every electron that has been accelerated by about 12 or 10 kilo electron volt, um, every secondary electron, once it falls on the scintillator, it typically generates about 100 photons, right? Now these photons, they travel all the way to the photocathode and as soon as they hit the photocathode, now they convert the photon to new electrons, which are called photoelectrons, right? So let's just recap this real quick. You have electrons from the incoming beam, they generate secondary electrons that are attracted by the Faraday cage. Then they are attracted towards the scintillator by the higher voltage. The scintillator generates photons from the secondary electrons. The photons travel through the light gap, light, light, light guide. And then once they hit the photocathode, these photons are converted back to electrons or the energy from these photons is converted back to photoelectrons. Right? So the schematic sort of gives you a more better visual experience. So you have all the secondary electrons flowing in there. Then H nu is the, uh, the nu is the frequency of the photon or the light. And then it goes and hits the photocathode. Okay. Now, once it hits the photocathode, it generates new photoelectrons. And then they enter the photomultiplier tube, uh, which is outside the chamber. Okay. Now the photomultiplier tube, is made of successive dynodes. These are these reflective uh, um, um, uh, plates uh, and each dynode is again maintained at certain potential. So let's just take a look at that. So this is how a dynode looks. You have these these plates which have uh, which are coated with uh, uh, with with very low yield, very high yield um, um, material that generates secondary electrons. So the photoelectron hits the first dynode, which is typically placed at a positive bias of about 400, uh, about 200 volts with respect to the photocathode, right? So the photocathode is here. Whatever the potential of the photocathode is, the first dynode is maintained about 200 volts higher than the photocathode. So the, so the photoelectron drifts towards the dynode. Now, once it hits the dynode, the first dynode, it generates more electrons, more secondary electrons from the material that coats the dynode, right? The dynode is designed in a way um, so that it generates, the material generates new uh, electrons, secondary electrons, when they are struck by the photoelectron from the photocathode, right? So now the second dynode is, is biased at about 100 volts higher with respect to the first dynode. So now the electrons that are generated here drift towards the second dynode and then you get the idea that every interaction with the with the dynode generates new secondary electrons and then the number of electrons keep increasing which is the entire principle of the photomultiplication right or the electron multiplication in this case right so for each electron there are two secondary electrons generated and over a successive multiplication uh, over over eight dynodes you can reach an amplification of uh, an order of 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 8. And you can control that as a user on the electron microscope. You can control what kind of amplification you're getting out of it by simply using the contrast knob. Right? Now, once 
all the multiplication, photo multiplication or electron multiplication is done, um, that is when it reaches the, the, the collector uh, preamplifier. And the preamplifier is again controlled by the user with the brightness knob that generates the that 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 gives you a control of the brightness of the image that you're you're recording okay right so now let's take a look at what is the efficiency of the signal collection itself you have the 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 tip of the faraday cage or the et detector at a certain angle that angle is def is defined by by psi which is right here and and the the size of the detector uh, is defined by omega which is a solid angle that the detector creates from the specimen right so if you have a, a takeoff angle psi if it is placed at a distance r and if the area of the detector here is about is given by a then the solid angle that it subtends to the sample is given by a over r square uh, which is measured in steradian right so typically in in a give in in your in your in your electron microscope if you have psi of 30 degrees and r of 4 centimeter that gives you a pretty good collection of the secondary electrons uh, and and usually that is what is maintained in these um, electron microscopes right now when I say secondary electrons, um, there are different ways uh, secondary electrons can be generated. Uh, what we have been discussing so far is when your electron beam falls on the sample, you have these inelastic scattering mechanisms uh, which generate secondary electrons that, that, that are released from the surface of the specimen. The other way secondary electrons can be generated, which is labeled as SE2 here, are when the backscattered electrons that were generated by the elastic scattering on their way out interact with a few more atoms in the specimen uh, inelastically, inelastically and generate secondary electrons. So that is SE2. And there are, there's another way you can have secondary electrons within your chamber, which is when these backscattered electrons that have already left the sample interact with the the walls of the chamber or the pole piece um, or any other um, optics that is inside the chamber and then it, it generates secondary electrons from that interaction that is also a source of secondary electrons the within the chamber itself within the electron column right so the ever uh, the, the ET detector the ever hard Thornley detector uh, cannot distinguish between what is the source of your secondary electron generation? So it, it actually collects all the secondary electrons. Okay. Now, the at the very beginning of this lecture, I said that you can use the ET detector as a backscattered electron detector uh, or a secondary electron detector, right? For generating both kind of images. So here is where the Faraday cage is very important. If you maintain the Faraday cage at about a negative 50 volts, that is sufficient repulsion for the low energy secondary electrons to not enter the cage at all. Right? So the only electrons in that case that could enter the cage and continue would be the high energy backscattered electrons that have typically energies in the order of 1 kilo electron volt or higher. Right? So what the so how you can control whether or not you are going to record a backscattered electron image from the ET detector is simply by changing the voltage on the Faraday cage. You go from a positive 250 volts to negative 50 volts. That way you are screening away all the secondary electrons, and the only electrons that are entering into the Faraday cage uh, are going to be the backscattered electrons. Now, if you want to use it in the secondary uh, electron imaging mode, you just apply the 250 volts that we have been discussing so far which is positive so it attracts all the small low energy uh, secondary electrons okay so for a given sample um, if you take the 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 percentages of the uh, various secondary electrons generated and those that are collected by the et detector it's quite interesting you have some um, secondary electrons that are generated directly from the sample 
uh, they drift from the specimen all the way to the ET detector. Uh, it, it constitutes a pretty low amount, about 9% 9, 9 in case of gold. Um, then you have these uh, secondary electrons that were generated from the backscattered electrons interacting with the sample on their way out. That is about 28% to 30%, right? And what's interesting is that you have a very high percentage of uh, secondary electrons generated by the backscattered electrons once they started interacting and striking with the walls of the chamber and the pole pieces, right? So the atomic weight of the material you are, uh, you are uh, imaging plays a pretty important role in the amount of secondary electrons that the ET detector is, is, uh, is going to um, see, right? Um, so, so think about this. Instead of gold, if you had aluminum, aluminum has a lower Z uh, or atomic number. That means it would have fewer backscattered electrons because the cr scattering cross-section Q is proportional to Z, Z square, right? So if you have fewer backscattered electrons, that means you would have a fewer contribution or generation of SE3, which is a significant amount of the total number of secondary electrons in the chamber itself, right? So now this gives you an idea of how the secondary electrons um, can also be used to give get some information on the z atomic number of the material. So in the last class, I said that you can use backscattered electrons for uh, or to to generate these composition contrast or atomic number contrast images. But in principle, you could also use a, a, a ET detector, or you could you could you could take advantage of secondary electrons to generate a Z contrast in in the images as well. Okay. Now, one of the advantages of a secondary electron detector or the process of secondary electron detection using the ET detector is the pretty impressive 3D um, 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 visualization that you get. It is not 3D, but your brain interprets it as a 3D image or you get some perception of the depth in the image or depth of these um, of the of the components in the image and that is simply related to the location of the ET detector in the chamber right so you have the ET detector which is at a certain angle and on a give on a certain side of the entire electron column which means you are going to have a preferential collection of electrons from one side of the SAMP specimen which is facing towards the detector versus the other side of the specimen which is um, looking away from the detector, right? So the side that is looking away is going to appear darker in the images and the side that is facing towards the detector will appear brighter. And then your brain is interpreting that as if there is light incident from one side of the, uh, uh, there is some visual light that is coming from one side. I think of it like uh, a shadow and light effect. Uh, if you were sitting inside a room and you had light coming in through the window, uh, then one side of your face would be lit up versus the other. And that gives you a different perspective of the same thing that you're looking at. Um, it gives you a, an idea of direction, which in turn your brain interprets that as an, an, as an, as an idea of uh, depth. Okay. So um, the other advantages of ET detectors are um, the excellent um, 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 signal to noise ratio so you have pretty crisp images and also the fact that they rely on a very old technology like scintillators and photomultiplier tubes that are old and robust and they have survived through time and they're still being used in modern electron microscopes so they are very well understood they are very extremely low cost and low maintenance which is why Everhart Thornley detectors are, are extremely common in electron microscopes. Okay, so in the next class, we're going to talk more about this. Uh, until then, bye bye.